to the first panel of our conference. Uh, this is Reform and Crisis in the Early French Revolution. My name is Megan Roberts, and I will be chairing this panel today. We have three great papers, so I want us to go ahead and get started. Our first speaker will be Robert Blackman, who is the Elliott Professor of History at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia. He has published articles in French historical studies and French history, and he has a book forthcoming with Cambridge University Press, which is titled 1789, The French Revolution Begins. And he would very much appreciate it if you would all order a copy. <laughs> So without further ado, I will turn things over to Bob. Thank you, Megan, and good morning. This paper is about the way in which continuing and expanding unrest that took place in France during the fall of 1789 and the winter of 1789 into 1790 became a political problem for the revolutionaries. It's also about how the deputies in the National Constituent Assembly used classical illusions to support its legitimacy, at least in part in response to attacks on its ability to control violence in the provinces. Over several days in February 1790, the deputies tried to formulate a plan to contain, to contain widespread unrest. Examining this debate allows us an opportunity to see how these two topics, provincial unrest, here figured as Benghazi, and classical virtue, here figured as Brutus, came together and helps us to understand both the political culture of the deputies and how the deputies portrayed events inside of the assembly hall to a broader audience. The terrible events of the 11th and 12th of September 2012 in Benghazi are well known. Four U.S. citizens, including the U.S. ambassador, were killed in a terrorist attack. The events themselves, as terrible as they were, became a means for one political party to attack the legitimacy of another. What might have been a bipartisan effort to improve security at embassies worldwide, or even to understand what had happened on the ground that night, became instead a way for one political group to attack the other through parliamentary means, through seemingly endless committee hearings and reports. After the presidential election of 2012, the matter turned into a way to discredit a future candidate for high office. Popular disorder and violence in the French provinces provided the opportunity for similar political attacks in February of 1790. In that month, the assembly heard reports from deputies about the deteriorating conditions in their home provinces, including reports of multiple and ongoing attacks on property by armed groups of peasants in the countryside. Deputies and constituents alike demanded that the assembly do something to restore order. On the 9th of February, the Abbe Henri Grégoire spoke to the Assembly on behalf of the Committee on Reports. In his speech, he claimed that the unrest came both from honest misunderstandings of the decrees of the 4th of August, 1789, and the deliberate acts of men who sought to mislead the people for their own gain. The Committee asked that the King do what he could to enforce the Assembly's decree on municipalities of the 10th of August, 1789, and that the president of the assembly write a letter to the municipalities letting them know that the assembly was concerned with their plight and that the disorders, quote, necessitated the executive power deploying all the force that was at its disposition, unquote. This was a very practical response uh, to demands that the assembly do something. After all, the assembly was the legislative and constituent power, not the executive power. If someone was actually going to do something, it would have to be the king. On the 10th of February, the Archbishop Talleyrand read a letter the Constitutional Committee had written to send out to the provinces, urging everyone to better uphold public order and explaining that the Assembly was working hard to write a constitution and redress grievances. The Assembly discussed the letter the next day and with little dissent ordered it published and distributed throughout France to be read from the pulpits and explained by the local clergy. This form of moral suasion was really all the Assembly had they had passed the laws, the king had signed them, and the laws had been sent to the provinces. It was up to local authorities to, to enforce them. There the matter, matter sat until the 16th of February, when Champion de Cisse, Louis XVI's keeper of the seals, and himself a former deputy to the clergy, sent a letter to the assembly denouncing the actions of brigands, defending the king's actions, and urging the assembly to do something about popular unrest and violence. It is here that we turn to Bézier, a city in the Aero department, and with it, Benghazi. In order to emphasize the need for the assembly to take action, Champion de Cisse recounted the events of the 1st of February in Béziers, when public order had broken down. 
There had been a municipal revolution in Béziers during 1789, and the new municipality supported the National Assembly. The main issue the municipality faced was that of salt smuggling. Though the assembly had made it clear that existing taxes would continue to be collected until they were replaced, throughout France there was an almost collective sense that despised taxes and feudal fees had been abolished. In Bézier, salt smugglers had acted with increasing boldness and complete impunity. In late January, the municipality reacted to demands from the holders of the salt monopoly that their monopoly be enforced. This involved bringing the local garrison out of its barracks to push back against rowdy crowds that supported the smugglers and to break up a crowd gathered outside the city on the 31st of January. Predictably, the encounter went wrong. In the confusion, one young man died, shot by the forces of order. The next day, a larger crowd marched into the city in search of the men held to be responsible for the young man's death, the salt police. What happened is of real interest to us and reveals why the Crown would choose Béziers as an example of the problem that needed to be solved. The municipal leaders, called consuls, went to ground almost immediately when faced with the hostile crowd. The local military commander sought authority to protect the salt police, to defend City Hall, and to disperse the crowd. He asked that at least one of the consuls stay in City Hall. He received no response. In the absence of military action, the crowd chased down and killed five of the salt policemen. Champion de Cissé strongly implied that the new municipal authorities had utterly failed in their duties. Louis XVI asked, through his minister, for direction from the assembly about what to do, given his desire to maintain order and to maintain respect for the laws. The debate that followed the reading of Champion de Cissé's letter was quite lively. Two solutions were quickly put forward. The Marquis of Foucault demanded that military, be force, military force be used to restore order nationwide as force was the only language the ignorant masses could understand. Grégoire responded that there was still a use for public instruction to resolve the situation, hinting broadly by a reference to the mid-July crisis that use of force would be counterproductive. On the 20th, 22nd, and 23rd of February, debate continued over what to do. On one side, conservative deputies demanded that the army be used to ruthlessly put down uprisings like that in Béziers, inspiring, as Depremenil put it, terror in those who would break the law. Recalcitrant conservative deputies, such as Depremenil, Casales, Montlosier, and Maury, made the unrest explicitly political, claiming that the levels of insecurity like those found in Béziers were universal in France and that they had been caused by the revolution itself. They proposed to end the crisis by giving the king extraordinary powers for a limited time so he could put down unrest throughout the nation. Powers for the king that could halt or even roll back the revolution. On the other side, deputies like Grégoire, Robespierre, and Mirabeau argued that it was hardly a good idea to kill the very people the new regime was meant to serve and protect. <laughs> the debate became heated as deputies made claim and counterclaim about who was to blame and proposal and counterproposal over what to do. It is at the height of this debate and at the height of deputy emotions as tempers and partisanship flared that we shift our topic from Benghazi to Brutus. The Brutus of our title is Lucius Junius Brutus, the patrician who led the movement to drive out Rome's last king. Brutus was a figure very familiar to the deputies, many of whom had a classical education and had read of Brutus during their school days and after. We see in reference to this debate a use of Brutus that corresponds to the story of the founding of the Roman Republic in 509 BCE, found in Plutarch's Life of Publicola, easily available to the deputies in French, as well as in Livy's History of Rome. The reference to Brutus did not turn up in the debate itself, however, but in Third Estate Deputy Gautier de Biosa's description and analysis of the debate in his newspaper, Journal des Débats et des Décrets. The Brutus Gautier de Biosa deployed was the virtuous Roman who defended law and good government, even at enormous personal cost. Historians have long focused discussions of Brutus in the context of the revolution on radical politics and above all on the period 1792 to 1794. And as we can see, most of the uh, references to Brutus that turn up in the Archive Parlementaire on a search at the Stanford site turn up in 1793. I would like to draw our attention back to 1790 and show that Brutus was used 
in the period of the National Assembly as well, though to different ends. Lucius Junius Brutus had long been an image of civic virtue because he put the common good above that of his own family. We see this Brutus in Jacques-Louis David's celebrated painting of 1789, first sketched in 1787, and this Brutus turned up in a play written by Jean-Élie de, de Jour to honor Mirabeau shortly after the Count's death in 1791. In Dujour's play, Mirabeau was able to convince Brutus, both of them enjoying their afterlife in the Elysian fields, that a constitutional monarchy with a strong king was the best form of government, even better than the Roman Republic. This Brutus, in the painting and in the play, was not a defender of republic republicanism as such, but of what Judith Schlar has called the Augustan charade, the idea that the Bourbon monarchy was the legitimate successor to the old Roman Republic, and to the pretense put forth by the revolutionaries that Louis XVI had restored the monarchy to its former glory after the abuses of Louis XIV and Louis XV. In this usage, Brutus was a symbol of the assembly's political virtue and a symbol of support for a just monarch at the same time. Gautier de Biozat invoked Brutus when describing how the assembly had dealt with an unsavory outburst by a radical deputy on the 22nd of February. During the debate, conservative deputies had repeatedly asked that the army be used to put down disturbances. After one such exhortation, the radical Breton deputy, François-Pierre Blain, fairly blurted out that to give the king dictatorial powers to send in the army would be to send assassins to stop assassins. This led to an immediate outcry on the right of the assembly. In the midst of the uproar, Blain asked to be allowed to explain himself. Once he had spoken, much more moderately, and apologized for his outburst, the conservative deputies were willing to let the matter drop. However, the liberal noble deputy Jacques de Menu insisted that Blain be disciplined and made a motion to call him to order, which passed with the support of the deputies of the center and the left. Blain had, come forward, had to come forward to be upbraided by the president of the assembly, and his mild punishment was to be entered into the minutes. Blain accepted his punishment and asked that his apology be entered into the minutes as well. Describing this event in his newspaper, Gautier de Bioza wrote that it was remarkable that those deputies, quote, who had always seen Monsieur Blain as favoring the people and public liberty, unquote, were the very ones who voted to call him to order. He wrote, quote, so the assembly has proven in this circumstance as in others that it is above all just and impartial, as in the most beautiful moments of Roman liberty, Brutus condemned his own son for having lacked military discipline, unquote. Here, Gautier de Biozat somewhat awkwardly refers to the episode referenced in David's famous painting. From his exile, Tarquin, the last king of Rome, had sent envoys to the city announcing his abdication from the throne and seeking the return of his property. Tarquin's real goal, though, was to find out who among the city's elite would support his attempt to regain the throne. The envoys found that Brutus's two sons favored their cause. The conspiracy was quickly uncovered and those involved were brought before the magistrates, one of whom was Brutus himself. Brutus saw his sons among the traitors and asked them three times to explain their actions. When they remained silent, Brutus bid the lictors to do their duty. His sons were stripped, beaten with sticks, and decapitated. Though some in the crowd had suggested lesser punishment, Brutus had refused to put the lives of his sons above his duty to enforce the law. When Gautier de Biozat noted how the patriots in the assembly sacrificed their comrade had gone, who had gone too far by comparing them to Brutus, he shows a conception of Brutus of, of virtue that Marisa Linton would recognize. However, there is a twist. Far from saying that the deputies were willing to sacrifice themselves to prove their own virtue, Gautier used the example of Lucius Junius Brutus to show that the patriot deputies were willing to sacrifice someone close to them someone dear to them <laughs> if he violated their collective sense of virtue. Brutus's sons had conspired against the Republic. Blain had brought shame on the assembly, a much lesser crime. But Gautier de Biozat's overblown rhetoric reveals a posture of virtue among the center-left deputies that would have a long future in the revolution's assemblies. He found in the willingness to denounce, to sacrifice, he found virtue in the willingness to denounce, to sacrifice a peer. This rhetoric of denunciation has been explored by Charles Walton, Timothy Tackett, and Risa Linton, and it would play a powerful role in the terror. Here, though, the assembly had not demanded blood. The deputy was merely brought to order. Where Keith Baker has found classical republicanism inherently eliminationist, 
We see here instead that it was a, used as a powerful way to demonstrate the legitimacy of the assembly without requiring violence. By linking the deputies to Brutus and their errant peer to the, his sons, Gautier de Bioza showed that the assembly deserved its power because of its virtue. Supporters of the assembly had previously located its legitimacy in the will of its constituents, in the Cahiers de Doléance, in majority rule. In Gautier de Bioza's commentary, the assembly's legitimacy was demonstrated by the virtue of its members. Given that Brutus served such different purposes in the early revolution, placing virtue at the heart of the old regime monarchy with David, demonstrating the virtue of a constitutional monarchy for de Jour or Gautier de Bioza, or as a prime symbol of the Republic from 1792 on, we have to ask why. As the possibilities opened up and the challenges changed, the meaning the deputies gave classical tropes changed. As circumstances shifted, the deputies had to find ways to explain to themselves and to their constituents what was happening. They had to find ways to make their understanding of these novel circumstances intelligible to their peers. The changing conceptualization of Brutus was part of a creative reimagining of the classical world to make sense of a society in turmoil. First, of a society failing at the top, then a society riven by popular unrest and violence, and then by war and civil war. It was a vocabulary used by politicians to communicate and to persuade those like themselves. The use of Brutus as an illusion was a way to take events far from the ordinary and domesticate them, put them into terms that could be used by those outside of the assembly to interpret unprecedented events in Paris and throughout France. And most of all, for those who supported the revolution, it was a way to rhetorically locate oneself, uh, rhetorically locate oneself on the side of virtue, making it certain that someone else would have to be the one sacrificed in order to save the revolution. Marisa Linton has done great work showing how denunciation and fear impacted the behavior of deputies in 1793 and 1794. They came to fear for their own lives and lashed out at those they suspected of harboring ill will. She has described this period as the politician's terror. And as Meta Harder and Michel Biard have shown, the need to sacrifice other deputies to prove the virtue of the assembly did not stop with the fall of Robespierre. In February of 1790, we find something much milder. In February of 1790, Blain was not beaten to death with sticks or decapitated. His punishment was a matter of something like an old regime uh, amende honorable, transferred into the new world of a representative assembly. Blain was not denounced by his political opponents, but by his allies. I suspect that this use of virtue signaling was common in the rhetoric of the deputies in 1789 and 1790, and that the men of the center and left were developing out of, the old, out of old regime discourses of virtue derived from Plutarch and Livy, a practical means for keeping rhetorical excess in check. The politicians' terror in the convention involved political murder. Even though the National Constituent Assembly could express its political needs using the same uh, sources, it used them quite differently. What we need to do is look for what changed that made a discourse of political virtue into a discourse of political assassination. I would suggest here that Annie Jourdain is very much on the right track in her recent book, Nouvelle Histoire de la Révolution. The stakes were changed by war. What needed mere correction in 1790 became amplified by fear, and above all, fear of betrayal, turning error into something that needed to be destroyed, transforming the fear of being held to account before one's fellow deputies via a note in the minutes, as terrifying as that is into the terror of being struck down swiftly by those who could muster a majority in the convention. Thank you.